In this episode, I host a dialogue between Doctor of Tibetan Medicine and Buddhist spiritual teacher Dr. Nida Chenak Tsang and Dr. Ian A. Baker, author, scholar, and initiate of Buddhist, Taoist, and Hindu tantric lineages. Doctors Nida and Ian explore the theme of Vajrayana in the 21st century, including issues such as tradition and innovation, mass empowerments versus one-to-one -one discipleship, and what is essential for successful practice. Doctors Nida and Ian discuss common mistakes in practicing the six yogas of Naropa, religious syncretism, and dark triad traits of narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism in spiritual teachers. Doctors Nida and Ian also discuss the role of religious institutions in the history of Vajrayana and explore the tensions between the critical historical approach of academia with traditional views often held by religious teachers and practicing Buddhists. So without further ado, Dr. Nida Chenak Tsang and Dr. Ian A. Baker. Dr. Nida Chenat Sang and Dr. Ian Baker, welcome back to the podcast. Happy to be here. Well, I'm so delighted to be hosting you both here in, for a dialogue on the podcast to discuss the theme. Our theme is Vajrayana in the 21st century. And this sprung really from your new joint venture, Vajrapath. And to read here from your, your website, the Vajrapath is an educational platform that explores the interface of Vajrayana Buddhism with contemporary global culture, art, and science. The platform provides a program of online retreats, public talks, interviews, and transformative journeys. And I know that you've both thought this venture through very carefully. And even the name Vajra Path, I understand, was chosen quite deliberately. So I'm wondering if you could perhaps talk a bit about why you began the Vajra Path venture and what it seeks to achieve. Dr. Nita, do you want to begin? Yeah, it's better you start. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I think it, what it really, the genesis of the Vajra path was really ongoing collaboration that Dr. Nita and I have had over many years in a variety of contexts, you know, from our first meeting in London many years ago when I was curating a exhibition called Tibet Secret Temple, Body, Mind and Meditation, in tantric buddhism and so we met in london when dr nida was there uh teaching the nejang uh form of tibetan yoga uh, and i participated in the course he was doing at that time and then we just continued to have various uh kind of meetings and discussions about uh in that instance the you know the essence of the vajrayana path and as I mentioned, I was curating that exhibition in London at that time, and then you know, I was also involved with the British Museum on their exhibition on Tantra, uh, from you know Enlightenment to Revolution, which Emma Ramos curated. And when she asked me if we could or organize a um, a talk on on tantric yoga, and uh, it you know at the outset as a kind of an opening for the exhibition, then I suggested that Dr. Nita and I. Uh, introduce that together. I thought it was very important to have a kind of cross-cultural perspective for the museum exhibition on Tantra. So we did that. Forget that was a number, that was, I think, in 2020. And then also, Dr. Nita and I have had a lot of uh, very uh, kind of, you could say, central role in the way that the Vajrayana Buddhism conferences in Bhutan have unfolded uh, since their beginning in 2016, um, and right up until this present one that just happened in October of this year, which was the fourth annual Vajrayana Buddhism Conference in Bhutan. And so the genesis of those conferences in Bhutan was tradition and innovation in Vajrayana Buddhism. So looking at where has Vajrayana come from, what is it now, and where is it going? And very much an international presence and a kind of dialogue, if you will, between international scholars of Vajrayana Buddhism and the traditional cultural holders, if you will, of that tradition in the last Himalayan Vajrayana Buddhist kingdom. So because of Dr. Nidas and I sort of having very kind of close relations with the organizers for the exhibition and proposing uh, different speakers and uh, persons who would come to participate and in a certain sense represent 
Vajrayana from a variety of perspectives. You know, we we found that our views were very much aligned, and we also could see that it was kind of necessary in many ways to work exactly with that principle of tradition and innovation to present Vajrayana Buddhism in a way that really met the needs of a contemporary audience and practitioners globally, not just West or East, but really in a way for the needs of the 21st century outside of perhaps some of the traditional contexts in which Vajrayana Buddhism has been historically presented and practiced. So that was really the genesis of the Vajra path. And as you said, we consciously chose to, in a sense, translate Vajrayana, yana meaning a vehicle, a method to move from one place to another, a path, a marg, if you want to, you know, the Sanskrit sense, but a yana, a vehicle, a method of practice. And so the Vajra path in that sense represents, as it's unfolding now, a experiential and immersive journey in the essence of what the Vajrayana tradition in all of its richness and complexity over the you know hundreds of years that it has existed and trying to refine it distill it and keep not just keep its essence but actually to really emphasize its essence in distinction sometimes to the unique cultural forms that it's taken in particular localities over time so looking at its essence and at the same time looking at how we can find common ground between Tantric Buddhism or Vajrayana with traditions in other parts of the world, both historical traditions, as we'll be exploring and I think speaking about, you know, when our, our first, you know, Vajra path journey will be in Greece uh, in this coming May. And that's kind of going back to, you know, that trip will end in Delphi, which was considered by the ancients the center of the world and a place of prophecy, a place of, uh, of revelation. And, uh, looking at some of the common grounds between the ancient Hellenic mystery schools and uh, what we can see in the archetypal archetypes of Vajrayana Buddhism. So that's, in essence, um, what you know we have been inspired by, which is to make Vajrayana Buddhism, if you will, increasingly relevant to, um, to a contemporary audience and how it can actually help people to you know, when we think of the path of life, it's sometimes it's just living and dying. But what is it that's beyond that? What is it that the spiritual path can offer in terms of connecting us with our true essence? Not in a way of renouncing this physical, the physical world and our engagement with it, but integrating with it. And I think that's what has inspired both of us uh, with the Vajra path as something that we kind of bring back the, you know, original joy and inspiration that one takes on the path and not just one of kind of uh, depression and renunciation, uh, which can be the pathologies of the spiritual path. We want to bring back, you know, the original joy that uh, inspired people to go beyond their current limitations, not because of, you know, finding them limiting, but just because of the natural expansiveness that the life spirit necessarily engages in when, when it's engaging with its full potential. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think also, um, so now globally, there are many highly qualified, uh, you know, Vajrayana masters, and many of them, they are giving teachings and transmissions and empowerments, you know, and sometimes the, some Vajrayana empowerments, like uh, so big, right? It's like uh, attended by over 100,000 people, and so, anyway, in the traditionally we say Vajrayana is a more um, kind of secret or private tradition, but now we know it's becoming very public. But then I think sometimes there are some kind of, um, uh, how do you say, it? for, you know, what, the reason I said there are many authentic teachers are teaching, and so most of the teachers, they have their sanghas and they have their disciples and students and practitioners, and then also becoming kind of the different groups, right? So they stay in their sangha and different groups, and then everything is kind of protected and teachings are only for them, you know, and which, which is great. But I think also it is a good time now that uh, bringing the Vajrayana's uh, uh, teachings or educations in a, for the general public, right? 
So mm. I think when we talk about uh, teaching needs a good karma. So I think now it's a karma that, uh, you know, general public already receiving many empowerments, but uh, lack of understanding. They really don't know what is the, the, the all importance of the empowerment, these things. So that's why, yeah, we are talking about these uh, issues. So then we really, uh, originally Vajrayana is not that complicated, you know. So normally I always say the organic version of Vajrayana, it's kind of very natural, uh, simple, and uh, all about direct experiences, right? So if mm. you talk about uh, 80 or 84 Mahasiddha stories, and um, so all the, each of them, they, ha they have, each of them, the, they had their own personalities, they have their own life stories, and they had their own uh, um, difficulties or traumas or dramas or, you know, whatever, right? Like, like, uh, let's say, you know, completely, um, like in our time, like a completely 80 different uh, kind of people, they are doing different kind of jobs. And then in a way, you know, they met their gurus and then they found their way of the spiritual path and the Vajra, <laughs> Vajra path. And then that is becoming, what do you say, the path of their, the, you know, to achieving the spiritual goal and so on. So that's why I think in a way, sometimes, you know, the traditional way to bringing Vajrayana in the modern world is uh, maybe too, too elaborated, you know, right? Mm -hmm. So originally from the 84 Mahasiddha stories, we see it's a more personalized practices and very individualized practices, very experiential practices, and also teachings uh you know, directly transmitted from the, the, the master to the disciples. And uh, in a way, it's very direct, kind of also like a shortcut, right? But then mm -hmm. later in Tibet, um, the system is becoming very complex and uh, really kind of like inst institutionalized. And especially in the giant monasteries, you know, they kind of build different systems. So therefore, it's it's becoming a very kind of systematic teaching. But then in order to learn the whole systematic teaching, you know, you have to spend a lot of time and effort. And, you know, you really have to study everything, you know, the things. I think that's why sometimes this classical way of learning and understanding and practicing Vajrayana takes too much time, right? And uh, so that's why we thought uh, this Vajra path should be something, we are not saying we are doing something very extraordinary or special, but in a simple way, in a direct way, Vajrayana is about uh, uh, experiences. It's not only about the philosophy or theory, right? It's very experience. So in this case, for example, like uh, Ian mentioned, we are... Uh, making the journeys and the travels to Himalayan countries. And also from this year, we start in this European uh, ancient sites. So, you know, once you travel to a place, right? Traveling and you are connected with the nature and you are connected to that place and then kind of reconnecting. And then if you learn or if you practice, then what do you say? It's a very experiential way, you know, right? So otherwise, today, when we talk about uh, Vajrayana or practices and mainly like uh, kind of philosophical teachings and many theories and lots of accumulations and all those things are great too. But because of the, the nature of modern people is very experiential. And actually, Vajrayana is not only like a theoretical thing, you know, it's a very experiential so that's why to bring for the public Vajrayana in a kind of with journeys and with uh, group meditations or group yoga to really feel it, to experience that, I think it's very important. So that is also one of uh, our main goal, you know. So that's one reason. And then another reason also, I think there are some 
uh, how do you say, misunderstanding of Vajrayana in uh, different levels, you know. And uh, so, yeah, some maybe some Buddhist group, they don't accept that, uh, you know, the tantric teachings in Buddhism. Vajrayana is the, <laughs> Vajrayana is the Buddhist tantra. But some people, they try to deny that the Buddha never taught Tantra, this and that. That's a very old story. And then maybe also in the, how do you say, New Age era, and uh, some New Age people are talking, you know, kind of criticizing about Vajrayana practices and, uh, you know, all the things. So, you know, I think there are lots of misunderstandings about uh, Vajrayana. And uh, misunderstanding actually brings the misuse of Vajrayana, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's why I think also for us, we should take some basic responsibility, you know. And if we if we introduce Vajrayana in for general public, and I think we have a responsibility to express or to, to let people know what is a real, genuine, Vajrayana tradition, what is the essence of the practice, right? And uh, so the essence of the practice, of course, then is we cannot say only experiential, we need to bring the some theoretical teachings too, but theoretical teachings are directly connected with the, the practical itself, you know? So yeah, that's why I think there, this also, those are the reasons why we kind of, um, put our effort together to bring this Vajra, Vajra pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, sounds very fascinating indeed. I look forward to, to watching how that unfolds. And you brought up, both of you, some of the key points I wanted to ask you about in terms of Vajra in the 21st century. And the first of those is, uh, following on from what you've just said, Dr. Nita, effectiveness. And you know you, we've discussed secrecy in, in 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 our solo interviews, both with you, Dr. Nita, and Dr. Reem. We've discussed secrecy uh, quite extensively, and it seems you've both said the cat is out of the bag. There, the books are published, teachings are happening, sometimes to hundreds or thousands of people at a time. Yeah, one of the arguments for secrecy that one hears, or at least limited access to mm. Vajrayana teachings, is to preserve the integrity of them and therefore their effectiveness. If everyone knows something about Tumo, for example, then this is an argument that one hears. I'm not making it, I'm just proposing it for the sake of discussion. Then there will be many misunderstandings and perhaps even deliberate misrepresentations. People will be practicing or teaching Tumo, for example, wrong, basically, and it won't work very well. Some say Vajrayana, as you said, Dr. Nita, should be taught master to disciple, one-on-one -on -one or very small groups, highly customized. Other, other times we see many lamas, high lamas, low lamas of all types, teaching Vajrayana to large groups, sometimes over the internet, for example, hundreds of thousands of hundreds or thousands of people at a time. So in the latter case, of course, there's rarely much monitoring of the students' experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, you've emphasized the importance of experience. There's not so much monitoring in a large group context of perhaps hundreds of people. Some have said that this implies, in a sense, uh, perhaps no real expectation of results on the part of the teacher. Others have said, well, such teachings are given for merit or perhaps to plant karmic seeds for future more auspicious circumstances. So I suppose what I'm saying is, what is essential for Vajrayana, in your views, to not only be taught effectively, but also to be learned effectively? Yeah, learned effectively. I think that's that's very important, you know. So I think we about the secrecy. Maybe this time is kind of over now because if we think of only just the Kala Chakra Tantra empowerment, and already millions of people have received it, right, from very highly qualified uh, masters. So if the empowerment is done in a huge scale for millions of people. And uh, so, which means now, the, you know, it's not, not, not just a question of, you know, the transmitting or giving the teachings 
uh, already a small group or this and that. Because um, actually, if you really understand empowerment and empowerment itself, they are all, uh, how do you say, secret teachings already included, right? So in Anuttara Yoga Tantra, we are talking about four empowerments, and then they have the subdivisions. And if you really read carefully, especially about Kala Chakra Tantra and all teachings about Kala Chakra Tantra, you know, everything is included. And in Kala Chakra Tantra, especially, it's so amazing because it includes so many also Hindu gods and goddess and, you know, many of these uh, mantras and practices and uh, mandalas and all the things, you know, like Kala Chakra has this body mandala, speech mandala, heart, mind mandala, you know, many of the things. And uh, also the creation stage and completion stage and everything is included in the empowerment, right? But so once they receive the empowerment and then they should understand First, tell you what they have received. And if you want to understand what you have received, you know, what you really got uh, during the few days of empowerment, this and that, and then that require, requires to really learn effectively, like what you are saying. You have to learn, you have to study, you have to understand, right? So once you really truly understand, and then you put into the practice, and so, you know, the, the, you, the common, the Buddhist, the three steps, it's a tersam gum. First, you listen and study or reading, and then you think and analyze, and then you meditate, right? So if somebody does in this way, of course, it's becoming, then the, the higher level, especially the completion stage and six yogas and these things becoming very, very effective, right? Of course. And... Uh, this effectiveness, like it, if, if we talk about the dream yoga, dream yoga is we are talking about the lucid dreaming. You know, even without learning dream yoga, millions of people, they know what lucid dream is because they had experiences. And humans, we have this kind of potentials. And the, we have this kind of potential. We have the nature. And plus, we are instructed how to do practice and this and that, of course. Uh, how do you say it becoming very experiential and uh, you know it's then we can see the effectiveness right so otherwise you know if some people doing like just a shopping style you know receiving a little bit of teachings here a little bit there oh i have tried for a few hours didn't work oh i tried uh, for a few days you know maybe half an hour a day or 10 minutes every day i tried for a few months oh it didn't work so is that the teachings, uh, is that <laughs> it, in that case, that's the teaching is uh, ineffective or the practitioner is ineffective, right? So there's always this kind of uh, questions. So that's why the one I said, um, um, Vajrayana should be experiential. And, uh, you know, I was also discussing with Ian our next journey to Bhutan, Maybe we specifically like a, go to some very special, like a Drupa Kunle's places, right? Drupa Kunle is the famous master for Karma Mudra. And we really go to his places and in his places, and we talk about his teachings, right? Then in a practical way, we are in that uh, space. We are in, in, the, in the nature and we are in his places and... Uh, so the air is different, culture is different, the nature is different. And then we can have an experiential way, we can have a different connection to the teachings. You know, I, I mean, in that sense, you know, but then also is not Vajrayana only just you practice and you get some results and then maybe you get enlightened or not. But um, we should go through the, how do you say, effective learning process too. But effective learning process, I don't think we all should go through the very complicated education systems, right? That That's what I'm saying. When I say the monastic uh, uh, systems to learn the, how do you say, the tantric systems, different schools are a little bit different, but some schools it takes, to learning tantra is, you know, it takes so many years. First, you know, you spend like 15 to 20 years you finish the sutra studies and then you are qualified to study the tantra, right? 
for example. So those are perfect. Uh, it's a monastic education system, but for lay people, for us, it's not that practical. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really goes to the to the key point. Is uh, certainly with the Vajra path, it's about discerning what is effective methods for a contemporary audiences that are not actually engaged uh, in a in a monastic system where in a certain sense these practices had to be elaborated and made increasingly complicated or complex simply because that was you know the the life choice of those engaged in a monastic system and as lay practitioners certainly in a global context when people have very busy lives it's not about filling the day with with additional elaborations but actually getting down you know to the essence of it and as dr nita you know is is saying we have these incredible tantric systems like the kala chakra you know which people receive for the most part as a kind of a blessing ceremony because you know the percentage of people who receive that empowerment you know from his holiness or, or from psychic reason whoever it might have been you know the number of people who receive that initiation who go through the elaborate processes of you know the three isolations of the six you know vajra yogas who go through all of the uh, very elaborate practices is very is very small but the beauty of a system like that which developed really you could say is the culmination of that very creative phase of where the you know the very the key uh buddhist tantras were being revealed let's say from guya samaja tantra hevajra chakra samvara you know mahamaya all of these and then kind of culminating in the 11th century with the the kala chakra which is particularly interesting because as dr nida was saying it was really representing the state of knowledge at that time and in both in terms of science alchemy uh medicine philosophy it brought in you know all of the hindu deities buddhist deities all working in a certain sense in synchrony and with an understanding of the body mind complex as something that needed to be brought into increasing integration and therefore the medicine therefore the alchemy and therefore these very very you know powerful sequential practices that bring us into where the inner potential that we all hold for an awareness that goes beyond just the normal range of what we experience through living and dying is actually brought forth and then integrated with our everyday experience. And to me, that sort of really speaks to the idea of secrecy in the sense that the Kala Chakra um, transmission has been given so freely, you know, everywhere from Madison Square Garden in New York to Bodh Gaya to, you know, around the world. And it has brought an increasing awareness of the, the power and theater, if you will, of Vajrayana. But behind all that, you know, is for many people, well, where do we, you know, we've received this initiation, but how do we actually actualize that which we've received the empowerment for? So I think our view in the Vajra path is about finding those effective methods that are applicable and realizable uh, in that incredible complex of of uh and richness of the vajrayana tradition and in that sense the word you know secrecy for me is is very interesting because if we look at it at least in the english language the etymology of the word secret has the same meaning as secretion and so secretion is that which comes out from our bodies if we look at it in medical terms you know we begin to secrete we ooze and the same way that we look at education education in english is not about implanting information it's not about feeding people with things that are external to them education means to bring out that which is within so the idea of secrecy has a power in that it's about bringing out literally educating the body mind both experientially so that that which we hold as our own infinite potential is actually realized in our conscious awareness and brought into engagement with um, the world around us and with other beings human and non-human however it might be so that to me is the power of the secret is that it's something that is not we have to get from outside it's something that we need to find the effective methods to access it within our being and therefore to bring it out so that is both you know the roots of education it's the roots in terms of effective teaching and it's also the roots of effective learning in the sense of not always looking outside and that's the whole idea of empowerment one in tibetan is about realizing that we have that capacity uh and 
discovering that kind of Vajra confidence, if you will, um, in our own, in, in the sufficiency of who we are and what we are in our essence, and then finding the tools uh, to bring that into increasing presence and awareness. So that, yeah, just to follow up on what Dr. Nida was saying is, you know, where I think we see the Vajra path as about distilling in some ways some of the complexity of Vajrayana as it developed within monastic institutions over time. And also going back to its roots, where we see already the kind of cultural transformation that Vajrayana took as it went across the Himalayas from, from India into Tibet, and in its interaction with and, in, and integration with pre-existing uh, traditions and practices. So what we, I think, near, are working with now is going back to that essence and looking at what is you know, what was cultural accretions and embellishments and what was the real essence that really has applicability in a transcultural context. And that's going to be an ongoing, that is the path. It's a path in itself of discovery, you know, for us. But as Dr. Nita said, the, the, the power and the beauty that we see with that is particularly when we have these kind of Vajra, Vajra path journeys, is that when we're working with a small, a small group, meaning up, you know, 30, 40 people, it might be, but the power uh, that comes through the uh engagement that everybody has with each other with the teachers the other teachers in you know in bhutan as it may be that we introduce people to there's an experiential kind of ex uh, recognition of the power of a tradition that comes in a very very different way than one was just reading about it in books or receiving teachings online so i think that's the power and because it's connected as dr Nita said with the power of place you know whether it's the power places if you will of drukpa kunli in bhutan whether it's the ancient sites of you know the pythia the oracle at delphi in, in ancient greece one's tapping into a kind of morphic resonance of and the power of place in order to tap into that trend that um that presence that goes beyond time, which of course is the whole meaning of Kala Chakra, the wheel of time anyway, is actually to discover the timeless presence that in a way transcends that trajectory of past, present, and future. <laughs> yes, I wonder, I wonder if we might go one layer deeper there, mm -hmm. uh, based on what you've both said, which is so fascinating. I'm thinking of two, two points. First of all, when we're talking about discerning, I think you said, Dr. Rian, discerning the methods, effective methods, and uh, distilling, these are some of the words that, that were used. It raises, um, in my mind, I think two questions. First of all, you know, distilling for the busy person. I, I wouldn't expect to become a skilled piano player or guitar player without dedicating a lot of time to it and perhaps having expert instruction and so on and so forth. It certainly wouldn't be compatible with a, if you want, busy life. It would be inaccessible to most people, I think, to achieve, say, a high degree of skill in an instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps, perhaps Vajran is like that. Or in, in another case, it doesn't take that much effort, actually, to be really quite physically fit uh, for a relatively modest investment. I mean, compared to becoming a skilled guitar player, for example one can actually be quite physically fit. So perhaps Vajrayana is more like that. What sort of in time investment is, is needed? What, which, which, type of, which type of skill or experience or transformation does it most closely resemble? That's the first thing. Hmm. Perhaps it's just simply inaccessible without a certain threshold of, of, of time and energy commitment. That's the first, so, that's the first thing. I think, yeah, the first, it's good you uh, break into points, you know. <laughs> so I think the first one, it's a good question. So that's uh, traditionally we say it's, it depends on your aspiration and karma and merit and so on. In a very simple, direct way, it depends the person's, uh, uh, how do you say, in the um, talent or in the nature and for some people, the result can be faster and some people it take more time. And that's why we have these two kind of styles traditionally. It's called the one is called the Rimchipa, it's the gradual path. So the Rimchipa, it have to go from step by step. 
like as you are saying the you want to become a, a, i don't know special artist or pianist musician you have to go through lots of uh, education and training and so on right so that part you know one way is like that and that's called the gradual path and some people they might need to go this because maybe they don't understand maybe they don't get it but they have to exercise they have to practice many many times right then the another one is called the rimji chikcherpa uh, chikcherpa means the instant one and then so that one you know it's not necessary you have to go uh how do you say in the all like steps you know like that right but then also there's um another one is uh, if like even you for example you told said if a qualified master gives the right to teaching for a very devoted uh, disciple he says the enlightenment can be even one instant like lakpa chankum the tibetan expression lakpa chankum is you you extend your hand like this and then you do like this so like this moment make two three second it it can take that much right so that's why that's i think it's very very much it de- depends on the personal uh how do you say personal karma or the personal potentiality or or i think yeah it's a it's a more individual question okay mm-hmm. and that's exactly that's why i'm saying if dream yoga some people they need the you know they need to practice a lot you know every or they go for a retreat or they, they do the visualizations and uh, 30 minutes one hour every day or some people even more and uh, then finally they can become lucid and then finally they are able to do the transformations and so on right some people just to receiving the instructions and this and that they have that uh, natural talent so then they don't need to go the whole the education or the long process right and tummo is the same thing some people they don't get it you know they try the visualization the exercises of course in the tummo you know there's one is a uh, one tummo is with uh, mainly with a visualization and that one the experience is a very subtle that takes more time and the second one is uh, you're controlling your breath and that one is a little bit faster because when you hold your breath right you hold your breath and body the physiologically many things change and then in our case the lung energy or the prana wants to force the holding in the belly so it it will produce certain amount of heat or temperature so that's that's uh, what do you say direct experience but then if you do the yoga part exercise part of course you know when we do yoga we all sweat right <laughs> when you when you do exercise do you sweat it's a very very basic uh, question so that's why it depends what kind of tummo you do if you do really the physical exercises of course everybody has the how do you say everybody generates the heat everybody experiences that but then the tummo exercise very strong we know in the how do you say if we talk physiological part releasing the how do you say different hormones and this those different hormones are giving us direct bliss and feeling good and pleasure excitement these things so that's why uh how do you say for me i am a soarigpa doctor so that's why i'm really interested in the to understand the vajrayana practices especially the effectiveness through the medical understanding too medical explanations too right so you know when we when we do exercise our muscles are generating the heat so that's why the you know our body increases the heat that's something normal right holding breathing is similar and then the mental one is the subtle and it takes time so then in this case what i'm saying is vajrayana should not be like a school every you know like our common school right everybody have to go to school and everybody study the same subject and for this and that some kids are very bad for math but they are forced to study and some kids are very bad for history but they are forced to study everybody you have to study so many things but 
when we go to university or college or when we make our own life our when, when we have our own careers many of the things we have learned they're useless right <laughs> in our modern education so i think vajrayana tradition should not be like a modern education it have to be very selective and it have to go and in individual individualized and in that case in that case what you practice is very effective for you and you can do it in a fast way compared to other people right so can i ask you a question back steve of course are, are you good uh, dreamer or no it's sleeper i'm horrendous at uh, lucid dreaming and dream yoga i'm an utter failure at that actually <laughs> okay so you see and exactly this is the perfect the question so then then you know you have that talent or not right so if you don't have talent and somebody maybe your master said you have to do it steve you know this is your karmic practice that will take years and years maybe one day you say oh no the dream yoga doesn't work you know this is just blah 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 you can say that right but then maybe in other cases maybe the other cases like let, let's say how about are, are you very like uh, you are physically very very how do you say physically very fit right you like physical activities yeah so in this case if you do talung you know the talung yoga that fits in your nature right that fits in your nature and if you do two more with this kind of exercises then it's very experiential for you so then you don't need to worry about dream yoga so you focus about two more uh -huh. right and then you like it you like physical exercises and you learn the talung chulkur and you enjoy the feeling of the heat and the bliss and so on and then for you probably dhamma will take a very short time does that make sense if somebody doesn't like you know physically they have lethargy and they are kind of lazy they don't like to move and they're always complaining oh i have pain here there you know some people are not like a physical people if we teach them, say, Tsalong, or you have to do and this and that, then it's kind of torture. Torture, it doesn't work. So that's why Yuto said people are trained in Tsalong Tulkur, the yoga exercises, or people are not trained in exercise. So that's why it's always become kind of, uh, how do you say, it's, it's a kind of selective group, so individualized. So I really like that. That's why Vajrayana has a really open-minded and very flexible view you know right it's not everybody we have to practice six yogas right if if your master said oh steve you have to study all six yogas one by one you know once one you finish then the next one like this and that probably you will stuck with one of them and then maybe you say okay i'm hopeless i'm ho helpless and then get depressed right or maybe you start to against the vajrayana <laughs> but the one one point as as you said like you know then some teacher says oh you know these things i just give you the teachings and you cannot practice in this life time and then maybe another lifetime this and that i think this is a little bit too old fashioned okay I have to be honest with this. You know, this is a little bit too old way of... Uh, so we are saying already degenerated the time and we wait next to lives. They are even more degenerated. We will become more hopeless if we don't do now. Mm -hmm. And for me, now, because of the still, you know, there are so many great, highly qualified, uh, great masters like His Holiness, and they are giving openly this great, uh, you know, Anuttara Yoga Tantra empowerment, the highest uh, tantric empowerments, and so on. I think we are really in a perfect time, you know, right? So that's about education, what I think. Ho hopefully that makes a little bit sense for you. It's kind of school and education system, but not like our education, you know, the regular education. Everybody is tortured together and you have to study and you have to uh, pass the exam, this and that. OK, but also I'm not OK with some people. They say, oh, we don't need the preliminary practices. We don't need the mondo and this and that. That is, you know, I, I hear more and more these things, you know. 
more and more like some, somebody says, oh, I'm practicing Dzogchen, I'm practicing Mahamudra, Chakja Chembo, we don't need the Ngondro. These ones are called the really misguided people, misleaded people. That says very, very dangerous. Do you understand? Actually, if we talk about the Ngondro, there's nothing wrong with the Ngondro. Ngondro is talking about our human basic essence, the nature, you know, how to cultivate how to cultivate a bodhicitta, loving kindness. And this is important. <laughs> without, without having these altruistic views or having bodhicitta, basic uh, human empathy or compassion or love or kindness. And then you say, oh, I need to, you know, I'm just uh, this, I'm uh, this practitioner, that practitioner, I'm special, this and that. And this is called the narcissistic view, and it's very dangerous, right? And and then people are without empathy, without, uh, you know, understanding other people's uh, feeling and kindness, these things, and we call it the psychopath, right? Hello, I'm asking you. <laughs> Your English is better than my English. Psychopath people are very arrogant. And they are very sure and they don't care what other people they feel or not because they don't feel. And then this uh, they have this uh, grandiosity symptom and it means, you know, they know everything, right? And they, you know, I, I know everything. I know the top. The top is the Dzogchen. Everybody, what all need is the Dzogchen. What you are talking about, loving kindness, what you are talking about, this and that. This is not Buddhist, this is not this and that. I think these things are very dangerous, you know, very, very dangerous views, right? So that's why in the education, once you really, you are in a level and you need to know you are what is your talent and you do that practice and you do it fast and you get a very fast result. But you cannot say in the beginning, you know, I'm ready to jump because I'm somebody special. Do you understand? And we know the, how do you say, as a result of the psychopath or narcissistic uh, people, when they bring the, how do you say, teachings or these things can be very dangerous, right? And, and narcissistic people like to make cocktails too, right? For example, now there are some... Tummo teachings are called the Taoist Tummo, Tao Tummo, right? But they even use the word of, uh, in, if you teach of Tummo Tao, maybe you can use a Chinese word. Actually, Chinese is called the Zhuohuo Yujia. There is a name for that, Tummo. And so they are using the word of Tao, and then the Tummo is kind of popular. Okay, I bring the Tummo, and Tao Tummo means it's a spiritual cocktail. So spiritual cocktails are, uh, made by these very narcissistic spiritual teachers. And these spiritual teachers, they can mislead uh, hundreds of people. So that's why, of course, they're, they're, that's the dangerous side too, you know. So that's why, of course, when we say education, like when I teach about dream yoga or bardo yoga, when I teach about bardo yoga, I teach sincerely from my heart because, you know, I hear so many people are passing away from my students and friends and this and that. For example, just in this new year, five or six people I heard already who are passed away, you know, elderly people. And they ask me help. I said, it's better you guys study POA and Bardo. And then, you know, you can help those people and you can help more people, this and that, right? So I just to teach the things without Ngondro, it's something it's necessary, you know, you need to learn faster this and that. But then if they're really interested in Vajrayana, I said, okay, first you do the Ngondro, make us some good foundation. And then if you are really interested, you learn the, the completion stage or whatever you feel it's right for you, you should practice. And in this way, we can find the balance. This way we can find the balance, right? I, I, we really need to find the balance. And actually, this is the reason in the Vajra path, we try to, you know, understand the Vajrayana and we try to understand the other cultures like Taoism, Indian Tantra, Shivaism, and ancient uh, Greek uh, spiritual practices. And it's not we say, oh, you know, what I do is special, what others do is wrong, or they are not enough, or they are this and that. 
and actually we humans we have this nature we we did this for last hundred of years even thousand of years i think we should stop this kind of uh, school fighting madness you know it's a time for unity right I'm sure there are many elements are similar to with the Buddhist philosophy or Greek ones and the, the Buddhist Tantra and the Hindu Tantra and the, the Tibetan Vajrayana traditions close to the Taoism, like Taoists, that they talk about, tan, you know, Tantian and this and that, right? So there are many things that are similarity and we we don't want to mix everything and we want to respect everyone because everybody has their own path and everybody they try their best. And it's good, you know, we have a neighbor. If we have a good friendship with a neighbor, that's a nice feeling, right? That's a good connection. And that should be the result of spiritual practices. We cannot say, oh, my, my neighbor is a Christian. My neighbor is a Muslim. My neighbor is that one. My neighbor is that one. And then you isolate yourself. And then at the end, Nobody wants to talk to you. And then you are just, uh, how do you say, suffering with your own eye, right? <laughs> Sorry, this part I went a little bit too much. <laughs> no, I think these are really essential points. And uh, I think, yeah, in the current times that we're in, when there's so much, um, you could say, syncretism, and people are exposed to so many different traditions and practices that are actually, in all cases, outside of our of a traditional western context then it's very natural that people are looking for what it is that um you know they resonate with and people you know are mixing and matching in many different ways bringing hatha yoga i mean in in many ways it's there's creative syntheses let's say for example let's just give you know one example with vajra yoga which is uh bob thurman uh from tibet house providing kind of the philosophical Buddhist basis for Michelle Lowe, who's teaching uh, traditional Hatha yoga in the uh, Astanga yoga tradition. And in many ways, it's a very interesting synthesis because so many people are engaged with Hatha yoga practice today, uh, but are always often looking for a philosophical outlook, perhaps that goes even beyond what uh, you know we see in, in the Yoga Sutras or some of the other explication or the Hatha yoga Pradipika, uh, which doesn't in any case, uh, elaborate in so many ways on the modern postural yoga forms that so many people are engaged with today. So I think there's some really wonderful syntheses that are happening. And of course, a lot of people are exposed to and practice in Qigong and Taoist yoga traditions who are also have been engaged with Vajra yoga, or let's say Vajrayana traditions. Uh, so I think all of that is something that we need to actively engage in the Vajra path and to look at where where is the common ground? Where can traditions that have interacted with each other historically over um, vast periods of time, how have these traditions evolved and in some ways diversified? And then that really is, as you were saying, Dr. Nita, the essence of the Vajra path is kind of going back to the roots of Vajrayana are very complex in the sense that, you know, if we look at historically, you know, what do even the the Buddhist tantras tell us about where they originated. And there's often this kind of semi-legendary land of Udiana up on the northwest frontiers of India, which is now held to be in the uh, foothills of the Hindu Kush mountains in what's now the Swat Valley of Pakistan. But we know that even when Alexander the Great, for example, traveled through that area, third century BC, he encountered Dionysian cults uh, in an area that is then, you know, a millennium later, became known and uh, kind of revered as the, the place of origin of the Buddhist Tantras. It's also the place, of course, where Padmasambhava is said to have come from, Udiana. So Urgyan Rinpoche, you know, the, the great precious teacher from Udiana. So we can see so many aspects of, of Vajrayana that have this kind of uh, common ground. And we also know from early accounts of travelers in that area, the degree to which tantric Shaivism was also active in the same area where the Buddhist tantras are said to have originated. So we can kind of see a creative synthesis that evolved uh, through interaction with and respect for different traditions and the way they borrowed techniques from each other to create new forms. And all of that is, of course, an experimental evolutionary process. Uh, we talk a lot today about cultural appropriation, but cultural exchange has actually been the very hallmark of cultural evolution. 
So I think when we begin, as we will, with the Vajra path, looking at its origins, where did it come from? How did it develop? What were the common, uh, what elements did it share with uh, with other traditions that were contemporary with it? And we can see a lot of very, very exciting and uh, common ground. But as Dr. Nita is saying, certainly for Vajrayana and therefore for the Vajra path, these foundations, the nundra, literally in Tibetan, you know, before you engage with the more advanced practices, there's fundamental uh, values that need to be embodied and fully integrated into one's being. The foremost ones being the four immeasurables of, you know, of loving kindness and a sympathetic joy and equanimity, because without those qualities, then even if we have, you know, extraordinary enthusiasm for the path, you know, the practices that we might engage with can kind of take us into, into sometimes dangerous territory. And that's, of course, what the origins of the secrecy was about. The idea that you know, the teachings were to be given by a qualified teacher to a qualified student. And that might vary from one to another. And as Dr. Nita has really emphasized, it's all about you know, the qualities that the individual student has, what are their talents, what are their capacities. I mean, my teacher, Chatra Rinpoche, always said that was his kind of parting advice to anyone he ever met. Practice according to your capacity. Practice according to your talent. Practice according to your nature. In other words, it's not about following some kind of ultimate prescription. It's about recognizing and uh, where you're talented in that way and following that inspiration. So that really is what a qualified teacher can do so effectively, and um, certainly what we hope in the Vajra path to, to help people to discern. And that's why, for me, it's so exciting that it has at its foundation, really, Tibetan medicine. The Soa Rigpa, the science of healing, is all about, you know, if we, get, if we bring it back, let's say, to the, the trip that we'll be doing in Greece, you know, what is the... What's written in ancient Greek above the temple of Apollo, which is the, where the oracle of Delphi was based, it was know thyself. So we don't know ourselves, but we don't know our own capacities and our talents and our disposition. And we just sort of follow a curriculum that we're told is the path that's going to bring us from where we are now to where we want to be. We can get lost on the way if it doesn't accord with our nature. So to me, the beauty of the Soarikpa, the science of healing, is to know ourselves, to know our constitution, and to work with that and everything from not just diet, but also the kinds of practices that we engage in to bring about that fundamental balance. So that's something that's not, you know, it's fundamental to, to really to Vajrayana. It's, and all of these practices are about bringing that, that kind of natural balance between the body, the energies of the body and, and the mind, the awareness. And uh, therefore, yeah, discerning that uh, really at the outset and then guiding people into the most effective ways in which they can realize their innate potential. Yes, Steve, what's your second point? I think you mentioned yeah. two points, no? Yes, well, I think you touched on it, actually. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm yeah, wondering. You mentioned about uh, Soarikpa and Tibetan medicine. I think when we talk about uh, Vajrayana, we have to talk about uh, uh, the health, you know, the health, right? Of course, physical health and also mental health. So if we talk about the mental health, we really need to talk about uh, mental health of uh, practitioners and also maybe we have to think about mental health of the masters, you know. <laughs> really, I'm serious. I'm not uh, criticizing anybody, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's good to think about these things, right? Mm -hmm. When we, you know, when we talk about uh, politically, we can say some politicians are very narcissistic, very psychopath, this and that. Spiritual teachers, we have the same thing, you know, right? Narcissists are everywhere. It's not like uh, all our spiritual tradition, we are free from narcissists or, you know, this and that. That's why I, I like this uh, this um, modern expression, the, the dark uh, uh, triad, triad, right? How do you call it? Yes, the dark triad. The yeah. dark triad, right? The dark triad. Actually, dark triad. It's it's uh, really makes sense for me because in the dark triad, there's the narcissism, and somebody says I'm the number one, and my teaching is the right teaching, 
and I'm only the right one, and I'm superior, you know, or I'm or my tradition, right? So that's the actually the 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 narciss narcissistic view is uh, I'm the victorious, you know, I'm the guy. You need to listen to me, and you blah blah blah. This one. So that's number one. And in the Buddhism, we always talk about uh, too much ego. You know, the ego, the ego, how can lead, uh, what do you say, the pain, the su pain and suffering to the others and the self and so on. And then number two is the psychopath. I think if we don't, uh, I don't have problem with psychopath people, you know, some psychopath people, they are really lack of compassion and empathy. Actually, it is a psychological state, you know. They need a help. But what is the best way to, to try to understand other people's uh, feeling and this and that? I think Ngonjo, when we talk about four immeasurables, you know, love and compassion, kindness, equanimity, it's a very good way to understand. But then... Then the third one is this uh, Machiavelli, Machiavelli Zim, right? That Machiavelli, it's actually, it was an Italian guy and he's the sneaky guy. Do you understand? He can, he can convince anybody. He can convince anybody. He can say anything because he always achieve his goal. And if he achieve his goals, he doesn't care. Other people got hurt. Other people got killed. You know, other people, this doesn't care, right? So that's why I think also spiritually, this the dark tried, dark tried. We have to check this if this is the symptom of the master or the symptom of that sangha. Do you understand? I'm not just blaming one sangha or one this. I think the this this will bring us. You know, normally it's you know somebody's like this. We we say oh it's a cult. You know that is a kind of excuse. But it just the saying, oh, this group is a cult, that group is a cult is not enough. I think it's good we if we have a kind of psychological analysis, a master or a group of people or a sangha, if they are really in the nature of this uh, dark triad, you know, they are very narcissistic and very psychopath and this Machiavellianism, I think we should be careful. We should be careful because these things are the, how do you say, misleading people and uh, and and i think these are the mispaths you know i know we're short on time or we have i know we have a time limit so i was torn earlier i hesitated because i was torn uh, of two questions that i really want to ask you so perhaps i'll just ask them both in brief and then okay. uh you can both of you do whatever you wish with it uh with our last uh, moments here the first one is Jean Monnet, one of the, if you want, architects of the European Union, said that nothing is possible without men, but nothing lasts without institutions. And the relationship between institutions and Vajrayana is, I think, a very rich area. And we've discussed some of that here. You've mentioned some of that. The movement, Dr. Rian, you were saying, of Vajrayana from a kind of fringe, maybe, or outside of the institutions, perhaps even transgressive phenomena into this eventual integration with, and perhaps even, as I think you've said, take over my mainline mm -hmm. state and monastic institutions in Tibet. So that whole story is a very interesting one indeed. And um, so I'd like to ask a bit about that. What challenges do you see facing the institutions of Vajrayana today? What's this, what can we learn from the past about that relationship and how, how should it go forward. That, so that's one thing I really wanted to ask you about. And then the other thing was, and you've also hinted at this actually, rather presently, that it's a question of propriety. When we start to talk about discerning and distilling, some say Vajrayana is a universal technology that should be available to all. And it's not limited to one cultural expression. Others say, no, it's, it's, a, it's a treasure in its current form. It's, it's a treasure of Tibetan culture and is being plundered by foreign scholars and practitioners who wish to, as you said, Dr. Ian, appropriate, mm -hmm. appropriate it for their own ends. And so, and this is not a unique debate, this is also a historical debate. Um, mm -hmm. Although perhaps the position of Tibetan culture and diaspora is, is, is somewhat unique in its own history. So, some people think 
it's skillful to extract particular practices from their context culturally and religiously and doctrinally. Mindfulness is a classic example of that. Others say no, it requires authorization and taught. You need you need the culture. You need you need the uh, the context from ideally from a qualified preceptor to give you the empowerment. For example. So I'm saying that I'm trying to paint some extremes here. Mm. How do we navigate that side of things? So first of all, it's the institutional question, and these aren't very related questions, really. I'm I'm throwing them out there just in the interest of time. So How do I think, navigate the, and then the second one is I think uh, institution. We uh, need a very relaxed and flexible into institution, leaded or guided by lay people. That's, I think, traditionally, like if I think my hometown, Repkong, you know, there we already have these Ngakpa communities. And actually, they are not that well organized <laughs> like monasteries. You know, monasteries, they have huge and beautiful, uh, how do you say, buildings and monasteries and very well organized. I always say Ngakpas are not well organized. But it's not we don't have organization. We have some kind of organization, you know. So it's it's the um, you know the 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 Ngakpa temples and you know Ngakpa temples and the centers. They are run by the local yogis and yoginis, and then the families, this and that. And we have rules, and you know we have kind of structure, but not really very strict. And this it's kind of more open and flexible. So I think. Uh, that that probably the best model for Vajrayana, <laughs> you know, ins institutional Vajrayana system, right? Mm -hmm. It's not there is no no system, no institution. There is something, but it's not too strict or not too many rules. So it's kind of open and flexible. Mm -hmm. This is uh, what I think. I'm sure Ian will express his views. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is uh, just to think of Buddhism. So Buddha was a Nepali or Indian. So in any case, the the, the Buddhism is uh, you know was spread there, right in Nepal and India. So it becoming originally actually local people's uh, practice or spiritual practice, but then later in time it was spread to Sri Lanka and to Thailand and to Indonesia, and many different places, right? So. Everywhere where Buddhism went is the essence, the main teachings, the text, everything stayed, but culturally transformed. You know, what they offer, right? What they offer, what kind of flower they offer, what kind of ritual they do, in a way, it's a little bit transformed. And then the Vajrayana start to spread in the Himalayan region and especially to Tibet. And then, of course, Tibetans adopted the, the Vajrayana teaching in a Tibetan way. And also when we talk about Buddhism, the Mahayana is vegetarian or not. And in China it was possible to become a vegetarian. So Mahayana stayed the more veggie, you know, the path of vegetarian vegetarianism. But in Tibet was almost impossible. We had vegetarian great masters, but to tell to whole monks and nuns to become vegetarian is there's no vegetation. So how people can survive, right? So that's why the you know the diet and lifestyle and many things it had to adopt in the Tibetan way. And then from Tibet went to Mongolia, you know, the structures, how to build this and that, like Mongolian temples and Bhutanese temples are different. And there even there's some rituals that can be very different. So that's why I think the culture is like the container. Container can be changed, you know. It has to be adoptive and flexible. But then the essence, what really contains, we cannot uh, change, or we don't need to change too much. You know, the the yeah, Ian was talking about the distillation because Vajrayana is already a uh, how do you say the teaching itself? It's already distillated uh, teachings, right? When we talk about the dream yoga, you know, when we talk about dream yoga. We are not talking that if you dream about yaks or if you dream just the snow mountains and if you dream the nomad or this and that. We are just talking all about human universal dreams. So the dream yoga's essence is already, it's a universal, right? Mm -hmm. 
The same way Tummo's essence is already universal because uh, our 24 hours of sun and the moon, you know, solar and the moon and cycle, this, this goes in our body. And that cycle is the base of the Tummo. That's why every morning when the time of sun rays, we do the Tummo practice. Externally, there is the solar energy and internally our Tummo heat is increasing, right? So then we don't need to say, oh, according to Tibet, you know, the time is arising, the sun is rising that time, and Italy is another time. I don't need to say, oh, I have to do the Tibetan time. I'm living here. I'm eating Italian food, right? My body was born in Tibet, and I, I grew up there, but now my body already adopted the air and the food here too. Hmm. Do, do you understand? So that's why... So I, I, I don't think the essence is something we need to change or we need to modify. You know, this is the really also the essence of the Vajrayana. Like you said in the beginning, Vajrayana teachings are universal. Yes, the meaning of Vajrayana teaching is universal, right? Just a very simple example is the, the clear light yoga. That's we are talking about the deep sleep state. And then dream yoga, that's what we are talking about, the lucid dreaming and what we practice and so on, right? And um, yeah, then about the poa is the moment of the death and how to die mindfully and consciously. Uh, and these things, these are all, you know, universal or the all humans, you know, we have this basis. And then we just uh, bring that technique or that teaching and how to deal these things directly. Do you understand? When we talk about the spirits and the monsters, we can leave Tibetan monsters and spirits in the Himalaya. We don't need to bring it here. So we have here the monsters and the spirits, you know, and the, the, the way to believe and the monsters and spirits, actually all our psychological issues, right? all our psychological issues. So that's why we need to deal with our own mind, with our own psychological issues. So yeah, that's why I don't think we need to modify things, this and that. Of course, about the rituals, you know, rituals, like when we do the puja, an essence of puja, some pujas are very short. What the Rinzajime Lingba wrote was very short. You know, we do in half an hour, the puja is finished, it's done. What is really important is to understand the meaning of puja, gana puja. But in Tibet, when we do it, is it take eight to ten hours per day, you know, for the whole puja. I used to join that, right? And then everything is kind of uh, all the rituals are kind of uh, extended, extended rituals because that time in Tibet, everybody has time. Everybody had time, you know. Right. If you don't do rituals, <laughs> then what you do? <laughs> so that's why, of course, it's already changing. And this change, I think, you know, changing and adopting, it's a very natural evolution. So I don't see any there, any contradictions or any problems. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Ian? Yeah, I would definitely, uh, yeah, further that view. And I think that's, you know, if we look really, what was the essence of, actually the historical buddha's own teachings is that everything changes that nothing remains one moment to the next the same as it's been before and i think you know just you know keeping that in mind uh and in that sense that speaks directly to a frame of mind which is open and flexible the same things that we're actually trying to achieve in any form of yoga is openness and flexibility and adaptability to outside seemingly outside circumstances as those change we we learn to adapt and and work with them skillfully with the presence of those fundamental values firmly in place of empathy loving compassion equanimity so i think you know with that view that the institutions uh, which we can see historically have often become very engaged with their own self-preservation uh, rather than actually reflecting the very core values that they were established to, to in a sense, enshrine, which is just the adaptability, flexibility, openness to literally, you know, as the great poet you know, Emily Dickinson said, just to dwell in possibility, not to actually fix things in time and space as something that's inflexible. So I think that's what we see in, you know, historically in the, the beauty of the evolution and, uh, 
uh, evolution of the of the Vajrayana path of the Vajrayana tradition, in that it was integrating uh, all of the kind of existing cultural uh, situations in which Vajrayana went, as Dr. Nita was saying, when it went to Tibet. It naturally adapted to existing conditions, whether that was East Tibet, West Tibet, Central Tibet. It went to it went to China, you know, with um, Vajrabodhi. It went, you know, with uh, Kukai to, you know, only a hundred years later than than Padma Sabhava went to Japan and adapted in unique cultural conditions there, you know, at Mount Koya. So I think, you know, the beauty is if we start to look at uh, Vajrayana in its own journey, in its own path, as it's adapted early on to to different cultural environments, you know, we begin to discern, in essence, of what what remains the same and what changes. And as you were saying, you know, with the architect of the European Union, uh, we learn to see that it's kind of a a mix of um, what when is it that we consolidate, and kind of uh, and when is it that we innovate. And that really is, I think, the way any civilization advances. I mean, again, in anthropological theory, it's often said in the same way, you know, we, it, that civilization advances through this, you know, dance of um, institutionalization and then breaking apart those institutions in order to allow for the new to emerge. And that's, again, we, we see that in, in all of these different uh, forms of culture. And I think of an anthropologist, you know, in Norway, you know, of Arne Ness and uh, Sigmund Pala, who used to spend a lot of time in Nepal, they had sort of this jazz theory of, of cultural evolution, which I always found interesting because it connects also with what we see in traditional Indian music of the ragas, this idea where you have a structure and then you innovate off of that structure. And that, you know, we, we see that with jazz, we see that with, with raga forms, you know, there can be these incredible um, innovations that then come back to the core uh, principles and but in the in the process the music as a whole goes through an evolutionary process through that expansion and contraction expansion and contraction not contraction in a negative sense but going back to the core principles and that's the play and dance of life I think and I think that's what to me is what Vajrayana represented as a kind of evolutionary movement if you will within Buddhism as a whole uh, over time, it was no longer made sense that it was a renunciate tradition that was for people who, you know, wanted to draw to drop out literally from the the world as it was understood to be as samsara, and you know there was no way out except to, in a certain sense, meditate yourself out from the desires and uh, beguilements that everyday life presented for as a norm, and to kind of detach from all of that. And I think as, as the tradition itself evolved, it recognized that you know, with Mahayana, which was a beautiful kind of reformulation of Buddhism, which is you were no longer trying to uh, get, you know, make sure that this was the last life you would ever live, uh, which was really the first premise of early Buddhism was not to be born again. But in Mahayana, you made the vow with the Bodhisattva vow to be born, born again until all samsara was emptied. emptied. And with the Vajrayana, you could say the third turning, it was, well, if we're in it for the long haul, you know, how do we overturn this dukkha? How do we overturn suffering? And uh, in the most skillful and effective way possible. And that was, you know, again, it's all kind of encoded so beautifully and and uh, directly within the, within the Sanskrit words of sukha. So sukha is bliss, sukha is happiness. And so if the fundamental problem outlined by the Buddha in the first noble truth which was taught to renunciates that all life is characterized by this dissatisfaction, by dukkha, things being out of alignment, and we our whole path is about avoiding the the desires and distractions that would reinforce that sense of dissatisfaction. I think Vajrayana's the beauty and power of it is that we actually overturn that fundamental discontent and dissatisfaction by the cultivation of empathic loving kindness and bliss. And I think that's, you know, where all the techniques are about. And I think that's what the philosophy is about. And that's why it's so important that the foundations, the nundro, if you will, of Vajrayana remain more and more articulated because of course, as we know, if we just pursue bliss uh, on its own without that foundation of empathic um, sympathetic joy as one of the foundational immeasurables, but also without the equanimity, that is the fourth of those, 
that we can easily just sort of fall into hedonic distraction and uh, you know actually reinforce ultimately what the Buddha said that the path of desire can lead us to to discontent rather than to liberation. So I think that's again where the institutions are the consolidation of philosophy and practice. And I think, as Dr. Nita said, you know, that they have to be open and flexible and open to reform. And I think certainly what we're trying to do with the Vajra path is to kind of bring, make it, as Dr. Nita said also at the outset, to make it simpler and more direct. You know, we don't need a lot of the elaborations that, you know, in a culture in which there was really no other kind of entertainment, uh, you could, an all day puja could be something that people really looked forward to because they didn't have anything else, you know, other work that they necessarily had to get back to. But we're living now in an age where we want very expedient means uh, to achieve these kinds of the goals uh, in the most effective way possible, but with the really firm ethical, moral uh, foundations that are there at the heart of the tradition. Yeah, today people spend uh, eight to ten hours on social media every day. <laughs> Ancient time, ten, eight or ten hours on puja, but that's time to time, not every day. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And we humans, we always need distractions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you. Steve, you had another question there that you were formulating a moment ago. Well, yes, the last bit of my question, I think you've really touched on it, I think. My half-formed question, you you picked it up, I think. It's a bit redundant now, but I'll say it anyway. It was mm -hmm. to do with um, propriety in the sense of who owns Vajrayana? <laughs> <You know? laughs> who, who should be allowed to teach it and, uh, and um, this sort of thing? Uh, I was contrasting this idea of, but I'm, go I'm going over ground that you've already covered a little bit now, unfortunately, but there, there's a question of cultural ownership is it a universal technology that should be available at all but dr Nina, you you address that um other feel it's a it's a treasure of tibetan culture shouldn't be shouldn't be is being plundered by foreign scholars and seekers um what in specific well i think everybody can can start <laughs> like as you said if you have karma you will study you will meet teacher and you learn right so yeah. there is no ownership and all the qualified or the really authentic practitioners are the owners of Vajrayana. We mm. cannot say it's that we cannot say it's a Tibetan culture owned by Tibetans, right? Maybe in UNESCO they will say that <laughs> they are yeah. already fighting for Tibetan medicine. You know, Tibetan medicine, so Arigpa owned by Indian government, this and that. But as a spiritual tradition, it have to stay a uh, universal for everyone. You know, it's a it's a it's a free no ownership. If there is a ownership, it's it's owned by the authentic practitioners, both yogis and yoginis. So uh, uh, an addendum here, we were chatting after we'd stopped recording, we thought we'd, we'd record this. I mentioned that I detected perhaps a little bit of cross currents between uh, a historical, critical, academic perspective of Dr. Ian and some of the more traditional views expressed by Dr. Nida. And so I sort of pointed that out and uh, Dr. Reen, you were going to comment on that. Yeah, well, I was saying I... called my style is called the nomad style. Nomad, nomad style. That's right. really nomad style. I'm a nomad, and uh, so the good thing is nomad also nomad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So certainly we hope to pursue things without madness. And I, what I was, I think, what we were, Dr. Need and I have often spoken about is that when, for example, the the Vajrayana conference in in Bhutan is always a very interesting example to see sometimes hyper academic, highly qualified scholars basically talking about aspects of Vajrayana that essentially nobody can follow. They actually don't have a sense of the audience. They don't have a sense of the material in terms of a way of presenting it in a meaningful way. And what I think one of the inspirations for the Vajra path in the sense that the conversations began to emerge within a four day conference where sometimes you could say the most qualified speakers were unintelligible because they were so immersed in the material that they were speaking about. And in, you know, the academic world, there's often you know, people focus on their particular area of research and really avoid at all costs trying to look at the common ground. And so it's often about 
about distinguishing it. And it makes it very hard for general audiences, I think, sometimes to make sense of the material. So what we saw, you know, for example, over four days of a Vajrayana conference was the real necessity to actually distill, to use that word that we were talking about before, into something that really, where does all this come together? Where, what can we say is Vajrayana if all of these different uh, topics that people were speaking about needed to be, in a certain sense, brought into a uh, single analysis? And I think that's that's really the inspiration for us, because as people would come to these conferences looking for inspiration, sometimes they would come out a bit confused as to what is Vajrayana. So I think that's really our challenge is to work kind of within you know, within the tradition of historical scholarship, and at the same time, really a living tradition, and uh, and to bring out what really our kind of mutual understanding is in the tradition. And I think, you know, as Dr. Neela said, you know, the nomadic and the the scholarly should not be in that way. They're they're completely. Uh, I, mean, I think we both follow my, I, my life. I would say, argue is almost as equally nomadic as yours, Doctor Nita. So, you know, yeah, we're, we're all, all travelers. Yeah, yeah we're yeah. all travelers on this journey, on the path, yeah, and yeah. we're all looking, you know, in a way, with 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 historical perspective on the evolution of a tradition. So, in that sense, we're, you know, we're nomadic scholars in the sense that we find inspiration in different places and hope to inspire others uh, by bringing them in to a vision of what Dr. Nina and I certainly both share as the Vajrayana as being the absolute culmination of the Buddhist vision, where it's no longer about renouncing the world or even transforming our experience, but about integrating into the full possibilities of our human embodied state. And with equanimity, with joy, with loving kindness and empathy, all of the qualities that uh, really bring make Vajrayana something in the end, very simple and very practical and uh, sort of navigating through all of the complexities in between to bring out this essence is certainly what I think we hope to achieve with the Vajra path and all of its different aspects. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I think that's an excellent PS. Do you have any comments on that, Dr. Nita, as a PS? <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's it. So I think it's it's good. Uh, I always love this uh, one quote from Albert Einstein. Einstein. This is my one of his favorite quote. He said, uh, "If you don't know how to explain in a simple way, it means you don't know well." Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I really love this his expression. He's you know, he is the, the smartest guy in the last century and scientist, this and that. I like some of his this, uh, quotations are really nice. And he mm. has so much this deep, uh, very basic uh, value about knowledge and about uh, wisdom. You know, I think I really always think that's so true. Mm. And I'm not saying, you know, I understand Vajrayana, but uh, in a way, we don't need to leave Vajrayana in a very mystic, you know, world, or we don't need to leave. We don't need to see Vajrayana is this kind of the secret and the philosophy and complicated, like untouchable and don't understand. You know, this. We don't need. Sometimes I really feel we don't need many of those things, and in a simple way, we really need to understand what Vajrayana is, right? In a, in a very simple way. For that, we need a very kind of uh, simple explanation. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, my, you know, I have studying and practicing Vajrayana more than 30 years. And uh, I had that fortune to study and uh, study from really, really highly qualified uh, Tibetan masters. And, you know, so I'm really, really fortunate for this. But then also many things, what I say is people saying, oh, what you say is very simple and very practical. It's not I try to make something simple. It is not as simplified, you know. Mm -hmm. This is how I learned and this is how I understood. So that's why it's in a way Vajrayana system is very complex, but in other way, it's also very, very simple and very easy to understand, very easy to digest. And also very logic. It really makes sense, right? 
it's very human and also very psychological you know that's why i try to bring some psychological terminology knowledges mm. too so that's why i i my personally i really like this uh, this way to really understand well it's the same way it's a buddhism right buddhism we can understand in a very simple way or we try to dive and very complicated you know philosophical views and then we debate and this and that this you know some people they like these things it's it's good for them but general public you know we are all lay people we all have our job and family we're busy maybe we don't need to you know invest our time so much for learning very complicated things so therefore i think we really need to understand this very simple and very very direct and very organic you know teachings of vajrayana and then i'm really my personally i like to do these teachings and journeys with ian and uh, yeah when i call him scholar he said no no i'm not scholar i'm nomad too we know he's a scholar too but i think that part also it's really nice you know right it's very nice because i come kind of uh, organic way you know organic potatoes are not completely cleaned you know <laughs> with little bit of the soil dirt and these things and then when you come with your uh, quotations and explanations and using the right words and terminology you know you can put in a very nice structure and in mm -hmm. a very kind of another level of understanding so that's why i think i really enjoying you know our collaboration yeah yeah i also feel i don't feel these things oh i have to say something correct and this and that something fits in your your talk or your thought i don't have this kind of things you know i don't think you have it too you know we are kind of our own way we are kind of very free you know i'm free my way he he's free in his way but we you know our ideas and thoughts and many things go together in an organic way you know mm. so i think that is also kind of very nice right it's mm. a kind of friendship and understanding yeah because sometimes i say is i'm not a, a, how do you say racist but sometimes i really feel like some uh, <laughs> now i have to use this uh, racist word some white guy <laughs> white <laughs> people you know the the they are can be i don't know teacher or they are learning something they try to hijack you know buddhism or vajrayana like what they know is the real one you know like what they teach is the real thing right they kind of like academically try to hijack and i can hear the things i don't like the things much you know mm -hmm. i heard somebody talking about uh, yuto you know they said oh the old yuto is uh, you know we really don't know it's a historical person or not that one we talk in tibet too but he puts also the young yuto it's a real historical i, I thought that's a little bit too much you know and then somebody was telling me how oh, you should uh, uh, you know respond for that i'm i'm tired of these things but then i really thought these things some people they try to i don't know like be the the real like scholar who knows everything who has uh, authorization of to say these things you know then that things i call it really like kind of hijacking right and then also some teachers maybe yeah, like you are saying, like who can teach? And then normally in Vajrayana tradition, if your teacher give you the permit to teach, and that is your qualification, right? So we always say, okay, we trust in teachers. But there is a time teacher should trust in you too. A teacher asks you to teach, and that is the highest level of the trust, right? Mm -hmm. So then, of course, if you feel you are ready, you can teach. If you don't want, you can still, you know, be humble and don't teach. But then there are some other, I don't know, the, the white guys, not only white guys, there are, you know, other people too. But they try to also teaching part, like a hijack the teaching part. This part, I don't like much, you know. They are saying, oh, don't worry about tradition, you know, like my way is this and that. You do this one and this is this. And then the kind of criticizing the old and classical, the traditions and kind of a little bit, I don't know, modernized or a little bit mixed. And this this kind of thing, I don't like much, you know. But then, of course, they're really nice and great uh, academic teachers like uh, uh, 
uh, Bob Thurman and, uh, you know, my teacher and my friend. I really respect because he knows so many things about Buddhism, very authentic uh, scholar. But same way also he brings the philosophy and the teachings in a simple level for the public too, you know, right? And so Ian really has this uh, very sophisticated and academic uh, nature. Also, when we talk, you know, like he he be careful every word what I say. And then we discuss these things. I really like it, you know, in a way, like we really go together very well. Yeah. Well, I'm very, very grateful for the collaboration. And I think certainly, you know, from my experience with all, you know, my teachers from Chatra Rinpoche or Kensi Rinpoche to Gorigan, Tindy Norbu, it's always been about, you know, the de-elaboration, you know, one, one in a certain sense, masters all of that but then in the end the path itself becomes so beautiful and uh adventure when it comes down to its essence and i think that's where you know dr nita and i have this wonderful kind of common ground that we traverse and explore and uh and hope to share because it really does come down to to this beautiful space um uh, in which the vajra path opens into such extraordinary possibilities for unfold the unfolding of our own human nature so i'm really happy that um yeah and the same you know bob thurman was one of my early teachers when i was studying in comparative religion at columbia university and you know i was able to see him just a few weeks ago and so you know all the different people that can inspire us from you know the the will you know the wild lands of, of the himalayas to to the academic um worlds of you know in europe and america so it's it's you know the wonderful people along the way uh who've been touched by vajrayana and who teach vajrayana is really you know the wonder about a path that in a sense is um you know if we're talking about the pathless path but it's just the adventures and and wonderment and uh that happen along the way that uh we really look forward to exploring together and very grateful to you steve for allowing us to kind of share the vision for the Vajra path and hoping very much and looking forward, you know, to your active engagement with it and, and uh, as, as the path unfolds. Yes. Well, I was going to say, you're both grateful for your collaboration. I'm grateful for your collaboration very much and that you're both willing to come here and share some of the fruits of that at this stage of, of the game on the podcast. So it's very exciting and cool what you're doing. And I wish you the best of luck with Vajra Path, your new venture. Whereabouts can people find out about it? Where can they join you perhaps on this Greece tour you've got coming up in May 2023? Mm -hmm. And I know Bhutan's coming up later on in the year as well, as, as, as well as your, your various online workshops. What, what's the best place people can find you at the Vajra Path? Yeah, well, currently there's a Facebook, a dedicated Facebook page, which is simply called the Vajra Path. And there's also a connected uh, Instagram account called the, you know, with the symbol at the, Va the Vajra path. And I think it's important for people to recognize because sometimes there have been uh, errors with not putting the in front in the same way for there's a dedicated email account uh, at the Vajra path at gmail.com. So those are the three major main ways in which people can connect with the Vajra path at this time. Uh, there is a website that will is under construction, but that will take more time because this is something that's really just being initiated now. So for anybody who is interested in it, we also have a designated person who is handling all correspondence. And so simply by writing to the Vajra path at gmail.com, uh, people will get her response. And uh, also by uh, the regular posts that will be available on the dedicated Facebook page. Those would be the primary ways now. And as you mentioned at the outset, the kind of the vision of the Vajra path in practical terms is to have series of online events. Uh, we have uh, already starting now on the 21st of January, a uh, uh, embodying the five wisdom Dakinis retreat by Yogini Tsiring Chidin, and she'll be uh, conducting that live from Bhutan, and it will culminate on the 27th of January, which is actually the last Dakini day of this year of the water tiger. And so anybody is welcome to, uh, to uh, connect with that. And we really felt that this was a, a really important foundational online retreat for the Vajra path, and that what we're looking at with the five 
uh, wisdom dakinis are the actual activities and wisdoms of the five dhyana buddhas which are sort of there at the very foundations of vajrayana as a whole so that will be coming up in a couple of weeks and then um, also for the uh, kind of inaugural if you will of vajra path journey to to greece uh, which will be held from the 22nd to the 31st of may uh, people can again contact uh, the Vajra path at gmail.com or look online uh, or look on Facebook for the Vajra path and connect with us that way. Um, but again, that's something we really see as a, as a very exciting foundation for looking at how East and West come together through these analogous traditions of healing and transformation. And then also, as you mentioned, we do have the re the, another Vajra path journey, to Bhutan that will begin on the 4th of, um, of October and going to the 17th of October. And that's gonna be a very, very exciting kind of follow-up to the uh, Vajrayana uh, Buddhist conference tour that Dr. Nita and I conducted this past October. And this will be kind of going, extending that from the teachings and uh, practices and places that were, we engaged with there, going right to the, the, the heart of Bhutan and the Bumtang Valley and connecting with um, the, really the essence of the Vajrayana teachings in a, in a very profound and powerful uh, locations in Bumtang and the Tang Valley. So those are the best ways for people to um, to reach us uh, and to find out more about the activities of the Vajra path, which will be evolving over time. Excellent. Well, I wish you the best of luck with this new venture. And Dr. Nita Chenetsang and Dr. Ian Baker, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.